Are your chains, are your chains gone this morning? Have you been set free this morning by the blood? Hallelujah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. I think of that scripture in Romans chapter 8 where it says, We have no longer been given the spirit of fear, the spirit of bondage to fear, but we've been given the spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father, our chains are gone. Are your chains gone this morning? Are your chains gone this morning? Thank you, Kathy. Thank God. Worship him in song and the dance. God is so good. He could look down and see a wretch like me and save me. He could save anybody. Praise the Lord. All right. You have your Bibles this morning. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to uh, Job. Job. Get a job. <laughs> no. Job. At the very beginning of that, of that book. We all know who Job was. I think we probably all know the story. I was thinking... Intimacy with God, intimacy with Christ, carries with it blessings, tremendous blessings. The closer we get to him, the greater blessings we receive. And we're not talking about material blessings or to that effect. It can be, but the closer we get to him, the greater blessings we receive. And not only do we get the greater blessings, we get the greater battle. The blessings don't come without the battle. How many of you have been in a battle? You've been in a battle. Now, I'm not talking about battles we make for ourselves. We do a pretty good job of making our own battles. <laughs> we do a pretty good job of getting ourselves in trouble. But I'm saying as we get closer to the Father, as we get closer to the light, as we learn more of Him and as we continue to learn more of Him, then the battles come. And when the battles come, we get to a place where, where we get to a, to, to a, on our knees and cry out, and then we learn more of him. It's a process where Satan wants to try to pull us away, but those, if we're really his, those things draw us closer. That's why the word says, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We quote that so quickly, but we don't even know what we're saying when we say that. Pastor Harold uh, most of you know my good friend, Pastor Harold. There's a little poem he likes to read. It says, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way. But left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow. And ne'er a word said she. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Those times, those battles, those dark places, that's where we learn who God is. That's where we get closer to Him. In Job, the very beginning of the book, it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. You know, if you read into the story of Job, there were people who maligned him. But God says he was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Sounds like the way I'd want to be. This book was written, probably some say it's the earliest, probably the earliest, uh, oldest book in the Bible. Maybe written by Moses or one of the patriarchs during that time. Talking about a man that lived in a place called Uz, that they're really not sure where that was. It's an ancient, ancient place, ancient book, ancient story. There's this man, Job, and he was right. He was right with God. He was as right as you could be. Talks about all the stuff he had and his kids and, and all that. 
And if you drop down to verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them, the accuser of the brethren. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down to it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Check out Job. Satan, because Satan, we know, if he's the accuser of the brother now, he was then too. Satan was probably up there reminding God about all of the people that he thought were his and reminding about all the things they do. <laughs> you know. That's what he likes to do with us. He'll stand in front of God. You do something wrong, I guarantee you Satan's going to be up there saying, Hey! Satan, the adversary, that's what that word means, said, God said, hey, Satan, check out Job. He says, uh, there's none like him in the earth. A perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil, verse 8. We talk about intimacy with God and we want to get close with God. I've heard people say, oh, God, I want to be a, a jewel in your crown. Man, you've got to watch what you ask for. Job was about as right as you could get. And God said, hey, check him out. And Satan said, in verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? Has not Thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his sub substance and is increased in the, in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse thee to thy face. Satan says, yeah, he's, he, he, just take his stuff away, see if he likes it in. And we know the story and without reading verse by verse. We know the story. God allowed Satan, said, okay, you know, take his stuff, but don't hurt his body. And Satan did that. And Job blessed God. Eventually, Satan came back and said, well, yeah, you know. Yeah, he's, he's, he's praising you, but let me, let, me, let me add him. Let me add his body and see what he does. And we know that God said, all right. And Satan afflicted his body. God said, you can do anything. Just don't kill him. Just don't take his life, but afflict his body. And Job ended up losing all his stuff, losing his family, losing his health, sitting on an ash heap, Scraping himself with broken pots because he had all these sores all over. And his wife came up to him and said, hey, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> and Job said, he's God. And the rest of Job is a series of speeches. He had three friends came to visit him. They came to visit him. They heard about Job, and they heard what he was going through. And they came to visit him, and... They, for about a week, they just sat there and wept and looked at him. Then they started talking. And Job's friends decided they were going to try to straighten him out. And they said, hey, Job, what, kind of, what did you do to deserve this? What kind of sin did you commit to deserve this? And if you read through there, and it's really a long, if you, if you read the book of Job, make sure you get a Bible that marks who's talking, okay? Because the three of them, they took turns talking. And and, and a lot of us, we think of Job's friends as they were like bad friends because they were like talking bad about him. But my good friend, Lovey Scott, Pastor World Overcomers, he said this. He says, they were good friends. Somebody said, well, they were good friends. At least they told him to his face. <laughs> at least they told him what they thought to his face, you know. I, I figure if you're going to lay something on me, at least tell me. You know, don't talk behind my back, all right? But the, the, whole, the whole thing of Job is they're telling them, oh, you know, Job, you know, your sin, and they go through this, all, all this stuff. And at the very end, of Job, and just encapsulating here a little bit. When it comes right down to the end of it, God says, hey, Job, I'm God. I'll do whatever I want. I'm God. And Job says something to the effect, he said, you know, I heard about you, but now I know you. Look at a couple passages in here, and we're going to turn to... Uh, Job chapter 23. We're going to look at a few passages here and then look in the New Testament somewhere.
See, I, 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 God laid this message on my heart because I know and it's not a, a word from God or nothing, but I know that some of you are going through some, some pretty tough stuff right now. And I'm sure if I ask you to put your hand up, yeah, everybody in here could put their hand up and say, man, I'm, I'm dealing with something right now. And I've always said this, whatever you're dealing with is the worst for you. If we started comparing, you ever know anybody that like compared misery? <laughs> okay. Don't compare your misery with anybody else. Yours is enough, okay? Look at uh, Job chapter 23 and start with me at verse, uh, verse 8. This is Job speaking. Job says, Behold, I go forward, and he's not there. If, if you read up to this, Job was saying, man, if I could just get an audience with God, I want to I wanna plead my case. He says, I go forward, but he's not there. I go backward, but I can't perceive him. On the left hand where he does work, but I can't behold him. He hides himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. Sometimes you look around, it seems like God is nowhere to be found. God is nowhere to be found. You ever been there? You ever said prayers and felt like nobody was listening except the mouse crawling on the floor? You ever look around and say, God, what's, what's happening? And this happens, and it's like one thing after the next, after the next, boom, 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 left, right hook, and you're, you're laying down, and you're saying, what's going on? You ever been there? Job says, I've looked in front of me, behind me, to the left, to the right, He says, I can't find him. Verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. It's like when Jesus was hanging on the cross and it got dark and he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God hadn't forsaken. God knew where he was. He says, Jesus was in a place where darkness covered him. He was bearing the sin for all of mankind. And there was a break. There was, a, there, there, was, there was a covering of darkness over that sin. Sometimes you look around and, and you think God's nowhere, but he knows exactly where you are. We were talking about this last week. You know, God always asked folks, uh, you know, he said, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. Adam, what have you done? He knew what he did. And we might, we might look around us sometimes and think, man, God is nowhere to be found. He knows exactly where you are and exactly what you're going through. Job knew that. We can't imagine the state that he was in. But he says, he knows the way that I take. When he's tried me, I shall come forth as what? As gold. That word tried it refers to a purifying process. You see, intimacy with God, the closer you want to get with God, He's not going to let you stay the way you are. He's going to cleanse you. He's going to purify you. He's going to make you, conform you into the image of His Son, Jesus. It's a process. What you're going through is a process. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. And it seems hopeless. But if you're His, then you have nothing but hope. You have all hope. Look at one more scripture here in Job. Turn over to, to chapter uh, 28. Chapter 28. I'm not going to keep you real long today. So he always says that. <laughs> okay. Listen to what Job says. Chapter 28 and verse 1. Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it or refine it. This is a King James. They said it should be refined, where they re refine it. Iron is taken out of the earth, and brass is molten out of the stone. You know, precious metals don't just, don't just lay around the ground, for the most part. Diamonds, jewels, they got to dig for them. Sometimes they got to dig deep. And when they do find the ore, it's not just like gold. They have to process it. I've told this story a, a lot of times. Many years ago, Rose and I, we went to South Dakota to see Mount Rushmore. We took the kids and we went to South Dakota. And there's a gold mine in South Dakota. And we went to go see the gold mine. Now, they, they don't take you down in the mine. But they take you to some of the preliminary processing plants. And they don't take you in the place where they really work on the refined gold either. You don't go in there. But to get one little ounce of gold, they've got to have like a ton of this big, ugly black rock. I mean, a bunch of them. 
And they've got to smash it and put it in acid baths and crunch it and just to get just to get one little. Job is saying. Intimacy with God, it comes from the deep. Sometimes we got to go deep. Sometimes we got to go in places that we've never been in places that we really don't want to go in the flesh. But that's where the treasure is. The heartbreak, the abandonment, the, that's where the treasure is. When you get so low and you call out to God and he allows his spirit to come and minister to you. Listen to what he says, just reading here a little bit and we're going to move on. He says, he sets an end to darkness and searches out all perfection. The stones of darkness and the shadow of death. The, the, the flood breaks out from the inhabitant, even the waters forgotten of the foot. They are dried up. They are gone away from men. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, and under it's turned up as it were fire. The stones of it are the place of sapphires. It has dust of gold. There is a path which no fowl knows and which no vulture's eye, which the vulture's eye has not seen. The path of God, the path of intimacy with God is a hidden, uh, dark, deep uh, path where only we can go with him. Nobody can go there for us. Nobody can endure what is meant for us to get closer to him. Intimacy with God. You want to say, I want to get closer to God. Okay. But it's the pathway is a place where nobody's walked before except Jesus. He said, look at verse 12. Where shall wisdom be found? Wisdom. Well, I tell you what, God, I have to admit to you, there have been a whole lots of times I've had a lot more mercy than wisdom. Okay. okay. You have to think about that. Okay. You too. You ever, you ever, you know, you ever forsake wisdom? For something expedient? Okay, all right. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knows not the price, verse 13, thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth says, it's not in me, and the sea says, it's not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. You can't buy it. Uh, it's not just laying around. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir and the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. Wisdom, listen, wisdom can't be bought. You can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars going to school and get an education. It's good to get an education. It's important to do that. But you can, you can get knowledge, but you can't get wisdom. Wisdom has to be learned, has to be given. It has to be mined. He says, in the very last verse of this chapter, and there's a lot in between, but I don't want to read the whole thing. It says, and unto man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. If you want wisdom, and that word fear doesn't mean cowering in the corner, afraid fear. But it means awe, respect, love, mercy. It means looking to God, fear God. He's God. He's the one that created us. If we want real wisdom, it has to begin at the cross. It has to begin at where Jesus died for us, that where, where he, he, he made a way that we can be connected with the Father through faith in his blood. That's where wisdom comes from. It's in those deep dark places where we grow close to God when everything is, is so, so desperate that there's nothing we can do about it. And the only place we could turn is to Jesus and say, Jesus, that's where we learn about who God is. There's so much more in Job, but I want you to look one more place with me. Over in Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> the first time I preached out of this passage, 
years ago. You've heard the story. Some of you have heard the story a lot of times. Back in 97, it was at a district rally down Northside Church of God. Well, let's read it. Let's read it. Start at verse 20, 24. To get put it in context. This was the night of the Last Supper, the night before Jesus was crucified. And uh, he, had, he had broken the bread and passed the cup. And they were, the, 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 the disciples, they thought with everything in them, they believed, you know, Peter, James, and John, and the 12 disciples, they thought that uh, tomorrow Jesus was going to, it was the Passover, they thought that Jesus was going to march in and conquer and set himself up as king and conquer Jerusalem and kick the Romans out. They fully understood and believed that he was the Messiah of Israel, which according to Old Testament scriptures pointed to a, a king who would come and reign and so they were expecting great things. Man, they had their eyes. They, in, in fact, it says right here that there was a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. They were, they were arguing about who's going to be vice president. They did that a lot. Jesus tried to tell them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be mistreated by the, the Pharisees, and they didn't hear him. You know, who's going to be the you know, Secretary of Commerce? Who's going to be... And Jesus said unto them, he must have, well, he had, he had some patience. He really did. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he doth serve. Well, I wish this should be like ministry 101. They should just make kids sit in class for like three months learning nothing but that verse before they want to go become a, a pastor or a preacher or a teacher. Okay. Now, but you shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you. Okay, verse 27. For whether is greater he that sits at meat or he that serves is not he that sits at meat, but I am among you as he that serves. If you remember, if you over, look over in John's gospel, just a little bit before this, what did Jesus do? He got down and he, and he, and he as a servant, he washed the feet of his disciples, including Judas, by the way. He says, you are they which have continued uh, with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me. Well, that sounds good. They're ready. Kingdom. Let's go, Jesus. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones and judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Man, this guy, they were ready. Let's go. Let's go. But then there's verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon... Simon, talking to Peter. Behold, you reading this with me? Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. I wonder if God said to Satan, hey, look at Peter. He's going to be the chief disciple. Look at Peter. Peter's ready to fight. He's ready to die. He's brave. Man, he's been following Jesus. Confessed him as the Lord. And Satan said, yeah, let me at him. Let me at him. <laughs> Who wants to be the chief apostle? Who wants to be in charge? Who wants to be God's man for the hour? You want to be God's man for the hour? Satan's going to go to God and say, let me at him. You want to have power? In anointing, and Satan's going to say, good, give him anointing. Let me at him. He says, Satan. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you is we. I, I, was, I was speaking before. The first time I preached this message was back in 1997, Northside Church God. First time I ever preached at a district rally. I was like, oh, you yeah, know, I was and the name of the message was called The Hour of the Power of Darkness. Pastor Spencer was there. It was just a few months before he passed away. And uh, I preached this message. It was a good message and a good service. And I felt pretty good about it. About two months later, Rose came to me and says, I got this lump in my, in my neck. So, swollen gland. It didn't go down. Biopsy. Cancer. I 
I was there. You ever been there? You all been there. I know you all have been there. I was there. You want to be be a pastor? Minister? Mm -hmm. You know, prophet? Priest? Gifts of the Spirit? God, give us gifts of the Spirit. Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Speak with another tongue. Give us gifts of the Spirit. That's great. But it's going to come... If God's going to bless you with a gift, Satan's going to say, yeah, let me add him. Is he worthy to, to, is he going to use this gift for your glory? Let me add him. Hmm. See, I, I, would, I would love to stand up here and we do a big old shout and glory to God and revival's coming. And I, I believe revival is coming. As we get closer to God, as God begins to pour his blessings out upon us, we can expect a battle. Don't think it's going to be without a battle. He said, Satan has desired to have you. He may sift you as wheat. I'm I'm glad he didn't stop there. He says this, but I have prayed for you. (laughs) I prayed for you, Peter. Peter, you're about ready to go through something you can't even imagine. But I prayed for you. I prayed. What did he pray? I often said, Peter, Peter's, uh, Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. And Peter was probably said, hey, Jesus, you left something out of that prayer. <laughs> you're not going to let Satan. Come on, Jesus. You're not going to let Satan do that. Are you? Come on, Jesus. You ain't going to let Satan do that. He didn't say that. I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted or changed. See, Jesus knew there was an end to the testing. He knew there was an end to the trial. He knows that whatever you're going through right now will come to pass. There's an end. You might not see it. It might not look like it's evident. But there is an end. And when you get to that end, you're going to see the purpose for what you've gone through. And what you're going through. Why? Because as we get intimate with God. As we get closer to the light. As we get closer to him. He makes us more and more and more like Jesus. He says, I pray for you that your faith doesn't fail. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And Peter said unto him, Lord, let's go. Ready to rumble. And he was. He says, he says I'm ready to go with you both into prison and to death. I'm ready to go. And, he, and Peter was. He, was. he was ready to fight for the kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny me that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that has a purse, let him take it. And likewise a scrip and him that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this is written must uh, that. That is written, must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me having that. Now, we all know what happened. When they came to take Jesus, Peter pulled that sword out. He was ready. He meant every word he said. Jesus said, put it away. We're not fighting. And Peter must have been like, He said, kingdom, Jerusalem, throne of David. Come on, let's go. Here it is. Jesus said. And Peter saw them take him. And we know what the gospel says and how he was treated. And Peter denied him as Jesus said he would. And really, they all did. They all ran, except for John. John was the only one that hung around. John, the beloved, does he, he hung around. He was there with the women at the cross. But every one of them ran. But, but Peter, brave Peter, the one in charge, 
And he did become the leader of the apostles for the first few years of the church. He ran and hid. I can't imagine in my wildest dreams what he went through for those three days between the crucifixion and the resurrection. I can't imagine. Just put yourself in his place. Big, brave Peter left everything to follow Jesus, ready to fight, pulled the sword out. And now, I don't know him. Who's he? I'm not, I'm not him. You got, me, you got me mixed up with somebody else. I don't know him. You know, sad to say, we've all done the same thing at one time or another. Not a whole lot of amens on that. But we've all said, I don't know. Maybe not in so many words. But we've all done that. I've done it. I have. See, here's the thing. All this I've said, and, and God laid this on my heart, because so many people are going through. I've never. I've, I've just. I've seen so many people being attacked on so many different fronts. As we get closer, as our intimacy with Him grows, we get blessed, and the battle gets hotter. It's nothing surprising. It's nothing. Don't don't. P- Peter said, "Don't be." When he wrote his letter, Peter said, "Don't be. Uh, don't be a." a, a a shame concerning the fiery trial that is about to come upon you. Because he knew something about that. Don't think it's strange. That's what he said. Don't think it's strange, beloved. If you love Christ and you're his child and you're wondering, why is this happening to me? You don't have to wonder. If you're his, he's just getting you ever closer and closer and closer to him. Just like he did with Job. Just like he did with Peter. Just like he did with so many other examples. Heroes of faith that we read about in the, in, in, in the Bible. That's what's all he's doing. It's hard. It's hard when your stomach clenches up. You know what I'm talking about? When you get that stomach. Ooh. It's hard. And you're sitting there. And you don't even know how to pray. Have you ever been there? But you don't even know what to say to God. He's there. See, I thank God. I'm sure in those, during those three days that Peter had denied his Lord. I don't know. We don't, we don't know what happened exactly during that time. I bet you he didn't say a whole lot of prayers. That's just my opinion. I think he was so overwhelmed with his guilt that he probably thought, I'm done. I'm done. But when Jesus was resurrected, he said, go tell Peter. Go tell Peter to meet me up in Galilee. I don't know what you're going through. Well, I do know what some of you are going through (laughs) just because I know you. But there's a lot. I don't know what you're going through. But I know this much, whatever it is, if you're his, there's an end. Jesus is praying for you right now. You know that? Whatever, whatever you're wrestling, whatever is attacking, whatever your battle is, Jesus is praying for you. The Holy Spirit's praying for you. God knows. He knows where you're at, and he knows the end. And he knows why you're going through what you're going through. You might not, and I I can't tell you why either. But he knows. I want to pray this morning, and we're going to dismiss. You know, sometimes we... We dismiss and I say, you know, if you want to come up for prayer after church, you can come up for prayer. But I think today I'm going to ask you, if you're going through darkness, if you're going through a battle, I want to ask you to come and we just stand and have a prayer for all. If you've been praying and there's no answer, if it seems like God isn't hearing, if it seems like there's no, there's no way out, 
I want you to know that there's an end. God knows what the end is. God knows what the end is.